Father God, you are alive and well, Father. Your spirit is alive and well in us, Father. And so we thank you and honor your presence here this morning, dear Lord, for you are our lively hope. We don't serve a dead hope, but we serve a lively hope. Christ in us, the hope of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just a couple things uh, in your uh, in your, your bulletin there. Uh, there's a section in there about the new Google site that late November will be started. I think last Sunday's message is on there already. Uh, yeah. So it's there. And YouTube. And, on, and YouTube is on YouTube as well. So, you know, it takes a little finagling if you're not a tech person, you know, to help you out with that. Because I'm not, so I struggled with it uh, last Sunday trying to get on it, get it all straight. So I found it. Hope I didn't mess up my computer in the process. But uh, it's on there, and so uh, it would be a great thing. But you have to get your own Google account, Google Plus, and uh, the intent is that uh, we can stream our services and also our Bible study for anything that we would like to present to the members or those who are looking uh, in terms of the Word of God, in terms of the grace of God, the love of God. I think that's a wonderful thing to do, so that that people will have access to that. So I just want to remind you of that. That's a good thing to do. It's also connected to my to the web uh, site that we have for the Place of Grace. Uh, if you'd like to go to that, you can click on that and take it to the website. It's there's it has some things on there as well. Uh, and you all know about Facebook and my rant is on Facebook as well. I, I do rant. So please take a look at that uh, as we come into this uh, Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, and uh, we do have the Christmas boxes here if you want to take advantage of that. As a reminder, there are words of wisdom in here, and they can be used as a devotional too because I know uh, there are words in here that the ladies put in here that you can use them as, as a devotional every day. Uh, so it has it is packed with uh, information, as small as it is. It's got a lot of information. Uh, I pray for Tony, he's still jumping out of airplane. So <laughs> I saw that on Facebook. So yeah. pray for Tony. Uh, he likes to jump out of airplane. <laughs> And Tim, he's in the Philippines. Yes, we, you know, we want to pray for them, and, uh, pray for them, pray for the people of uh, the Philippines, uh, because that is a destruction that we can never imagine our own minds in terms of total devastation in the Philippines. It, uh, we certainly need to lift them up in our prayers, and, and uh, the God of peace uh, will come there and begin to direct the hearts of the people. Because quite often, when you have that kind of devastation. There's a lot of thievery and all kinds of things going on in the country that's been devastated by uh, by disasters such as that. But we can intercede with our prayers, right? Yes. Amen? Yes. We can intercede with our prayers. And that's what Althea was talking about earlier. And praying for one another because our prayers do have power. And that kind of leads into the part. I get started with the message. You know, Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew, let's turn to Matthew. And, and we all have this question because I, I think sometimes, you know, I thank you, I thank you, saints, that you're here to hear God's word. It's in Matthew uh, chap, uh, chapter uh, Matthew 24, chapter 24, verse one. And 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 you know, you can become really, we can become complacent, uh, inactive, uh, kind of a, a nondescript, kind of lazy with God's word, and there is. A malaise can come over you if you're not careful, you know, because we can become really complacent and lazy with the word. But Jesus, you know, the disciples were always looking for signs, always looking for signs as to to uh, what was going to happen in the future. And and you know what, we can see signs if you're if you're anything of a Bible student, if you're anything of in the spirit, you can feel the things that are going on because God shows us the things that are going on, and so we can see in the word that that. The world today is closely aligned itself with what the word says about the end times. Now I'm not I'm not saying this to, to, to cause you to, to be in, in great fear, but there is a there is a celebration, a celebration of life for us. Because we know I know where my house is. Amen? I know where my force is. I know where my health is. I know what my substance is of. And and so I want to give you that assurance, that that blessed assurance that that Christ is in you, the hope of glory, and so we walk through the difficulties, we walk through the troubles, and as a song we sing, you know, we walk through the, through the rivers and we walk through the fire, but I will not be burned, I will not be drowned, I will not be burned, 
And then so we're in Christ. And if we're in Christ, we should not fear the coming of what's going to come. And, and, but, but, but they always have this question of Jesus, you know, and, and, in chapter 24 of, uh, of uh, Matthew, it says, Jesus departed from the temple area and going his way, his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the building of the temple and to point them out, then point them out to him. And let's see, let me go down to verse 3. And while he was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, and I'm reading on the Amplified Bible, tell us when will this take place, and what will be the sign of your coming, and the end, the completion, and the consummation of this age. So we know that we're in an age. We don't know the exact time, but we know that we're in an age. And it says, And Jesus answered that. And we know Jesus speaks truth. So then Jesus answered and says, Be careful that no one misleads you or deceives you and leading you into error. For many will come in, in on the strength of my name, appropriating the name which belongs to me, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not frightened or troubled. So see that you are not frightened or troubled or dismayed about these things. And so the God kind of goes along with what we've been talking about, a thorn in the flesh, and those troubles which come our way. And ultimately, he's, he will tell Paul, the Spirit will tell Paul about that, don't be troubled. And Paul sees all these things, so we'll get to that in just a little bit. I know you can't wait. I can't wait either. It says don't be frightened or troubled, because when we're troubled or frightened, we're not in God's perfect love. I'm in God's perfect love. Ah, look, are you in God's perfect love? Yes, I am. Amen. I'm in God's perfect love. So I don't care what comes my way. I'm in His love. I can deal with it through His love, it's which strengthens me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It is my hope. And so at the end of the day, when I'm caught up, I'm going to be with Him. And if I don't get caught up and I die before He comes, I'm going to get caught up anyway. Amen. Because the dead shall rise in what? The dead shall rise in Christ. The dead shall rise in Christ. So, you know, our story is going to be a great ending. A great ending. Our, our story. And so I want to encourage you, whatever trouble you've seen this week, whatever troubles you've sensed, you're in Jesus. You're in Christ. You don't have to walk around like you're in eggshells. Because you're in Christ. I don't have to walk around like I'm on eggshells. And so he goes on and says, and says, so don't not be frightened or troubled, for this must take place, but the end is not yet, for the nation will rise against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in place after this. All this is but the beginning of the early pains of the birth of pains of the intolerable anguish then they will hand you over to, and he goes on through, as in uh, most of you have read this, he goes on through a whole litany of things that will come into the world. But we have a, a response to be, be aware. God, we need to be aware of these things. We need to be strengthened. Now let's turn over here to, to Psalm 27, I believe. Psalm 27. And, and how many of you know that if anybody will, that was buffeted with troubles and difficulties, it was David. In spite of his kingship, he had troubles and difficulties. And here we go. Chapter 27, the Psalms. Verse 1. The Lord is my light. Am I what? He's your rescuer. He's your restorer. He helps you to recover. He is my light. Is my salvation. He rescues me. He makes me whole. Whom shall I fear? If he restores me, if he's my help, if he's my rescuer, then we are in fear of anything, are we? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a refuge and a stronghold of my life. There's a song that I forget how it goes, but the Lord is a refuge and stronghold of my life. But but he is the Lord is a refuge and stronghold of my life, just part of it, all of it. Of whom, of what shall I be afraid? I have no reason to walk around in fear. I can't walk outside and you know what, and I, I, 
you know, because there's some people that are afraid to go even go outside. Right. Amen. Right. Even walk outside, even go across a bridge. Mm -hmm. Right? The people that are afraid to go across bridges. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, "Who's not here?" None of, these, none of these things that are in the world are in there. They are going to paralyze me into inaction, into walking up my life. Who's not fear? Who's not afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, ever felt like you're just surrounded by this crap? Yes. Amen. Did I, did I use the right word? Yes. <laughs> When you understand what I'm talking about, yeah. you're surrounded by stuff. Yeah. He doesn't abandon you in the midst of a fight. Yeah. Jesus will never abandon you in the midst of a difficulty, in the midst of a fight. And so he is our refuge. I know the city loves Psalm 91. It's a great song. Yeah. You know? It says, Though they encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, even then in this will, I will be confidence. Confident. Confidence, a hope, an expectation in Christ. It really hope means in Christ, it means a confident expectation. So we have a confident expectation in Christ that we can overcome these difficulties that easily beset us. Somebody in this world has to walk with his confidence. And it's going to be us that walk in this confidence, right. making a difference in the world and standing on the word of God. Yes. It's going to be you and I that are going to be making the difference. Will we will we be troubled? Will we be will we will we be shaken or try to be shaken? Certainly those things will come our way. But our confidence as David had, that we see a lot of songs filled with David's confidence in the Lord and going to the Lord, knowing that he would be buffeted, but he stood on God's word. So one thing I asked the Lord that Will I seek, inquire for, and inst inst instantly require that I may dwell in his house, the house of the Lord, in his presence all the days of my life, to behold and gaze upon the beauty, the sweet attractiveness, and the delightfulness and loveliness of the Lord, and to meditate and consider and inquire in his temple that we find peace when we tabernacle with him. We find hope when we tabernacle with him. We find a sweet fragrance when we tabernacle with him. Now translate that in a contrast then, if that same light is in your eye, if that same hope is in your eye, and yes, our lives are but a vapor, we are supposed to leave this same fragrance of the Lord behind for generation for generations to come. The same fragrance that will bring somebody hope after me. After you are dead, after we are dead and gone, we still leave this. You know, there are things that my grandmother said to me that I still remember to this very day. There's still a love that my grandmother had that I still feel to this very day. Because she left that fragrance of love behind. She left that fragrance of hope behind. And a lot of other things. But you understand that, that we have to find ourselves in this holy temple every day. Just, 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 just uh, these walls are just walls. But we are the building. We are the church. We are his holy temple. Amen? We are his holy temple. And we take Christ everywhere we go. We take his hope with us everywhere we go. We take his trust with us everywhere we go. So everywhere you show up, people say, why are you, why are you not upset? Because Christ said be hopeful. Because I have prosperity. Because I have a peace. Because I have a love, I have a hope. And so those things I want to encourage you with this morning as we were in, involved in our praise and worship, because you know what? He is, and I forget the, the next to the last song we sang, but he is our, you know, unchangeable. He is unstoppable. That's who he is. And we have to find ourselves in there. And so I encourage you this morning, don't fall for the malaise in the world today. But Stay falling for Jesus. And our hope is in Him every day. It's so easy to get caught up in the stuff of the world today. It's just so doggone easy to get caught up in the traps. And God doesn't want you in the trap. And I think that's kind of what I wanted to kind of point out to you today about that. Now, there are many there are many songs that David speaks about in the covering of the Lord. And I would encourage you, if it's 
And we all have down days. We do. We all have down days. But we go to his word. And we go to his spirit that's in us to encourage us and to build us up and to keep us lifted up. Yes. In him. In him. In him. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Encourage you this morning to stay focused on him in your life. And the hope that he brings you and the love that he brings you because truly he's in love with you. Not that we love him, but that he first loved us. Yeah. You and I. And that's a short promise. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And so we take that and we simply run with it. We run with it. You know, we run to God. The song that we sing, we run to God. Every day. There's not one day that I don't run to God. Not one day. Because he reveals something in my heart where I need to run to him for. Every day. I find myself in some manner running to God. Because some kind of strange thing in the top of the body. And I said, oh Lord. i got to cast that vain imagination down. Because there's all this up against the knowledge of God in me. I should know better. But sometimes those are, all got caught up in that. Well, you know, I do the things I don't want to do. You know, I want to do good. I know to do good. I need to do more rightness. But I don't do those things. I know to do good. That's his flesh. We talked about that a little bit. That was one of his forms that we talked about. And we all have that in our lives. You know what? We do it. We know that we shouldn't do it. But we're going to do it because we want to do it. I do the things that I don't want to do. So it's a good to see that other great saints have problems. Too. Amen. 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 So Paul got through. Amen. We can get through. Amen. And so I just wanted to kind of share that with you to kind of keep us focused on the wonderfulness of our God. And that's so important. So we have been talking about Paul. We have been talking about your form. And I promise you today that I'm not going to be long. I promise you. Amen. And because there's there's just, so we're going to kind of dig deep into you know, what, what is this thing Paul's talking about? We, we, we know that, that last Sunday we talked about uh, uh, him on the road to Damascus. And we know that Damascus was just a great city back then. Uh, he was outside of the gates of, of, of Damascus, and, and he was going to get a letter to, we know that, to, to prosecute the, the Christians. And we know Paul's character. We talked about his character. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And, and Jesus came to him and spoke to him about, you know, why are you troubling me, Paul? You know, it's useless, useless to say it's useless to trouble him. And the manner in which he spoke to Paul was in the manner that could only reach Saul at that point. He called him Saul. And we know that that kind of language was, was going on between Jesus and, and Paul was in the basic language of Arabic Hebrew, even it was plain language in which he spoke to Paul. And, and so we know that Paul had revelations and many revelations beside this. And uh, we see some character in Paul as we make that one of our, our base scriptures in, in terms of talking about Paul's thorn that eventually came. And so we, we kind of left off at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12. And we know that Paul makes reference to revel, uh, revelations. We'll talk a little bit about that today. So in the Amplified Bible, I'm reading 2 Corinthians 12, 6. And, and, and I'm trying to, to, to have us to understand that, that we all have things in our lives that maybe more than one thing in our lives that cause difficulty, cause hesitation, cause some paralysis, cause some doubt to come into our lives. There's none of us here that are immune to that at all. And we all have those, you know, if we're living this life, let me just say this, if you're living life and you move the guard, you're going to catch a thorn too. You're going to catch a thorn. You know, if you ain't doing nothing, you're not going to catch a thorn. You know what? But if you're living for God, you're going to catch some thorns. Amen? you catch some thorns. And so, I want us to realize that we all have issues. And you know what? God, when, 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 when Paul had this vision, uh, he, he, 
with a vision of whether he went to, to heaven in reality, that's, that's questionable, but the point is that God spoke to him. And, and that was for, for Paul, that was for Saul, that was specifically for him. And we'll talk about a number of things, but you know what, God has a, a word specifically for you to help you to deal with those thorns in the flesh. To help us deal with those things that come into our lives. And, and it was a dealing with those things in an open, honest fashion that we can we can we can deal with the stuff in our life. We have to be open and honest to deal with the stuff in our lives. And in order to deal with my my relationship with the stuff that I have, I'm talking about, I'm talking about me. Now my relationship with Alfie, I have to deal with my stuff. I'm responsible for my stuff in my relationship, but it has to be an open process in our relationship in order to to, cut, to get over the difficulties, to get over the circumstances. Because if I'm hiding something, if I'm not, if I'm keeping something back, guess what? I'm, it's not going to do any good in the relationship. I'm just talking. That's all I'm doing. I'm just talking. So we will see that 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 in order for Paul to deal with the, the issues, that there had to be an open discussion between him and God about what's going on, what Paul had to deal with. And so I, I, would, I would probably tell you that at the end of the day, that God prepared Paul for his specific law by what he told Paul. And so like Paul, God prepares us for a specific law that we have to walk out. And God will encourage us in that, in the walk that we have to walk out. Because guess what? You'll be in places that I, I won't be in, Stephanie. And God prepared you for that. For you, not me. Because you can deal with that. And maybe my personality can't deal with that. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'd get there and blow the place up. <laughs> That's how I get rid of problems. Blow the place up. You know, just how I like it. You know, just get rid of everybody. <laughs> you know, talk about it later. But God comes to you in your walk and tells you how and he graces you, graces you, gives you his ability to deal with that specific situation there in that specific circle of influence that you have. Amen? And Debbie can't come in and do that, what you're doing, because God's given her something else to do that's differently. So God gives us and equips us those things that he wants us to do. Amen? 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 I, I can't go I can't go and, and play fireman, because I'm not a fireman. Amen? I'm a fireman. Right? I'm not a fireman. Don't give me a hose. <laughs> that's exactly right. And so, we'll be seeing that as we as we go through this. And those revelations were so sweet so, to, uh, to, to Paul that they left a great impact in his life, a tremendous impact in his life. And so these are the revelations that he's talking about some 14 years ago, which made such an impact in his life, which was so personal, which was so unbelievable that he couldn't utter a word to anybody about it. Because it was not possible for him to describe what God had personally spoken to him because nobody would believe it. Nobody would believe it. It's been the undescribable. Indescribable. And so 2 Corinthians 12, 6, it starts in the Empire Bible, that should I desire to boast, I should not be a witless, ragged, for I shall be speaking the truth but I abstain from it, so that no one may form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me or fears from me, and to keep me from being puffed up and too much elevated by the exceeding greatness of the eminence of these revelations. See, Paul, and see, you have to understand that Paul had a specific vision with God. It has a specific word from God. From God. And we know that, and we'll talk about it, we know that Paul was an aggressive person. We know that because we see that in Acts 9. When he went to get his 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 his, his authorization to kill Christians. We see his abrasions, we see his arrogance. But that same boldness, that same kind of Arrogance, that same kind of, 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 of let's, let's, go, let's go to it, God would take that same 
shrimp or wheat and turn it around for good. He would take that same strength of character, you know what I'm talking about? And turn around for good. And so God was 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 showing Paul these certain things about himself and his certain walk. But still that same strength of character, that same boldness now would be used for the gospel as opposed to against the gospel. Specifically for, for him. Just for him. So those are the revelations that he's talking about. And, and, and and this is what he felt after he had those revelations. And this is what God was showing him. But it will also lead to something else later on. And maybe I'll give it away now. At the end of the day, we're going to get to my grace is sufficient. Amen. At the end of the day. That's what we're going to get to. But, but God had revealed certain things to him, to Paul, before we could get to that, that point. So, so what he sees in me or fears from me and keep me from being so puffed up and too much elated. So my wife tells me when I get puffed up. <laughs> so tell me, David, you're thinking too big of yourself. <laughs> you're too arrogant. <laughs> and I have to, I have to kind of settle myself down. So oh, okay, let me catch myself. Because we can get off on our own arrogant trip. Because see, my same strength of character, my same strength of character, and you know, I realize in law enforcement that man, if I could just cut your throat, I would. Right? That's right. That's, and that, that's just a, an embellishment. <laughs> and so I have to be, I have to be, I have to hold back. I have to be careful because what I might say out of my lips is going to hurt somebody. If I had it my way. But in the other hand, that strength of character was excellent when we got to a swap situation. Amen? It was excellent when I got to a commanding situation. Where we had to deal with some difficult things. But I can overuse that strength in my relationship with people, my relationship with God, with my relationship with ministering to people if I'm not careful. It damages. Now I'm in a world a realm of damaging people. And so Althea has to occasionally remind me, David, you're not a police officer anymore. <laughs> right? Just turn it off. Just turn it off. <coughs> you told your story about me waving at somebody as they went by me. <laughs> turn that off. She reminded me, David, you're not a police officer anymore. <laughs> Surely you've never been there. <laughs> Put the badge down. Put the badge down. And so we all have, and God will show you, if we're open to God, except to the God, He will show you where we need some correction. Amen? When we're open to God. And so it's a process that Paul is going through. Personal process with God and His law with Christ. So he wouldn't, at least this is what he felt, so he wouldn't be puffed up to remind him that he could easily slip back. Easily slip back into what he was. Because we can, if we're not careful, slip back to where we were or used to be or what we came out of. A strength, as I said before, can be used as a weakness, can become a weakness. So, so, so these revelations were given to me to be a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to rack and buffet and to harass me. We'll talk about those things too. To keep me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about this and begged that it might depart from me. We talked about that three times. That one time that Paul went three times. Separate times to God, begging and asking. And we'll, as I said before, we'll get to the end of it when we when we understand. And I think we'll get have a clear understanding when God says, "Paul, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient." 
See, Paul was privileged. We know that. He was taught by the best. He had the best, the best training, uh, the best uh, in terms of the uh, environment that he was in. He was privileged, but he was under attack on false teachers. We know that. Our uh, reading scriptures, and we'll see that. Paul could have chosen to boast because of what God had revealed to him, but he couldn't. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. God gave him the ability to speak the same. Sign. We know God will give you the, if you're around, God will give you the ability to speak to people at, at various levels in, in various languages that they can understand. And so God gave Paul the ability to speak to uh, his base in the manner and the fashion that he had in order to reach them. <clears throat> that was apparent back there in the first century. His adversary would come to understand that Paul could play the same game that they could play. Paul came out of that. So if you're trying to get Paul, Paul played that game. Paul played that game of threat. Paul played that game of locking people up. Paul been there. So you're threatening an accusation against me, Paul, so I can play that game too. His boastings would be, but God, but his boastings of Paul would be to move people to God and not to his problems or their problems, but Paul's purpose was to move people to God as boastings now, and not boasting about himself and his ability. <coughs> his problems. Second Corinthians 11, <coughs> excuse me, as surely as the truth of Christ in me, no one in all Greece will ever stop me boasting about this. Why? Because I don't, don't I love He says, I love you. God knows this. Says, no, God knows I do. Said, but I will continue to do what I have always done. This is a little picture of all strength. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. These people are false apostles. Paul had a problem people saying, well, we're preaching the same thing that you are preaching. Paul says, no, you're not preaching the same thing I'm preaching. So you're condemning people. So I'm lifting people up. I'm encouraging people. I'm going to boast to that. Because there is a difference in what I'm saying and what you're saying. But that's just a small example of Paul's ability to mix it with his ad adversaries. It can be encouraging to see, point one, encouraging for us to see that great men of God had issue. It, it's encouraging, not the bad way, but encourages us to see that, you know what? My problem is not that unusual, that there's nothing new under the sun. That problems have existed for 5,000 generations, 2,000 generations. And God has seen it all. God's seen every human frailty in the world. And yours is not any more special than Paul's. And so God can, God is capable of dealing with your issues. Christ is able of dealing with your problems. He's able, he's capable. Because my problem is so special that God can't deal with it. They were giving them, well, don't touch this. Sometimes when I'll be a question, don't touch my leg. <laughs> but sometimes that's how we get with God. So my problems are really special. You really can't touch this guy. <laughs> but he made it. You know, that's a crazy thought, you know? If I'm a relationship with the God who wants to help me, you should have to let him touch my knee. But my initial reaction is, this, hey, it's hurt. Don't touch it. Don't touch that. That's, that's real special. God, you got to be real special to feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, real special. Right, before you touch this. Now, this is my bad mom here. This is all my excuse. You know, for being mean, for being ugly. For being hurtful. Surely people understand that. Don't touch that. Hey, we can get the same place in the heartbeat. Same place in the heartbeat. So the God wants to touch us there, where we hurt. Paul's prayer could be our prayer as well as with similar aspects of our life. The same prayer that Paul prayed to God three times would be our same prayer because we've inquired from God as well, probably more than three times. Deal with stuff in our lives. I got both hands up on that, right? right? Both feet. Amen. I'm wearing God's ear out. Lord, please, take this from me. Amen? Right. That's exactly right. So, you know, we're in the same place that, that, that Paul is in. You know? 
this request is not a casual request to God. The pain that's going to be talked about pain, pain, mental pain, physical pain is debilitating. It can paralyze your life. And so this is not a casual request that Paul goes to God three times. I mean, he's screaming and talking about the pain that I was in when, you know, we've all had physical pain or mental pain in some way, and it hurts, it paralyzes you. And you can do anything to get comfort. We will do anything to get comfort. To get comfort. And, but we have to turn to Christ and let's get his comfort and his love. Like Paul and Hannah, one never gets a thorn, like I said, unless one is on the move doing something for God. If you're doing something for God, there's a thorn coming your way somewhere along your life. There's something that's going to try and stop you from doing something for God. It's coming. It's sure as you sit here today. Some arrow, some fiery dart is going to come your way. I'm not boasting of that, but if you're living life for God, something's going to get in your way. And that's just what, that's the kind of life that we're, if we're doing something for God, Something's going to get by you. Keep stating here, there's one common thread with Paul or with him. It's trusting God no matter what his remedy may be for us. That was a, that part was the important thing. Trusting God no matter what the remedy may be. Because sometimes we may not like the remedy. Because we only want our, mem our remedy. But God knows the right medicine the right medicine for each and every one of us. God knows what it's going to straighten our lives up, what it's going to reduce the pain, what's going to reduce the hurt, what's going to diminish that, what's going to diminish that. God knows how to write my prescription. Specifically. Right? He knows how to write my prescription. And so are we open to his prescription? His way. Because God wants to get right at the point. He wants to get right to the problem. And deal with it. And so that's what he did with Paul. He got right to the issue and described to Paul what was going on. So, so where are we today? Have we been trying to live with thorns in the flesh? I can't live with thorns in the flesh. Because it hurts every day. It just hurts every day. Make a decision because we see that with Hannah and Paul, they made a decision to follow God. Hannah still trusted in God despite the, the pain and bitterness from Benaiah. Paul still trusted God in spite of his problems and issues. Be encouraged by what he tells you. You may not exactly like it, but be encouraged by what he tells you. I don't always like what my wife tells me, but it's for my good. It's for my benefit. It's for my health based out of love that she has for me. And I may not always like to hear what she has to say. Matter of fact, I don't always like to hear it. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I don't always like to hear what my wife has to say to me. I'd rather go downstairs and turn television. You hear that? <laughs> hey, that's right. That's exactly right. And, and so it's just like our relationship with God. Sometimes we, we may not like to hear what he has to say to us. Because we may not be exactly what we want to hear. I'm just kind of being honest with you. Because God knows us. He made us. He knows the situation specifically. And so we have to be open to that. And so Paul was in a situation where he was going to hear some things from God that maybe he didn't quite like. Well, maybe God didn't quite answer his prayer on time. Or maybe God didn't answer his prayer at all. Now that's not that God doesn't love us. But God is God. God knows the beginning. He knows the end. And we haven't started to talk about contentment yet. But are we content when God doesn't answer our prayer? Are we content when we pray for somebody and they die. Doesn't mean that God's not a good God. And so I just want you to kind of think about those things. Because that's kind of where God is going with Paul. Paul, are you content with you living your life for me? 
if I don't answer your prayer about removing your thorn. David, if, if, if your leg hurts from now until you die, will you still love me? Will you still preach my word? Will you still show me strong? Will you still believe in me? Will you still believe that I'm a good guy? You see, that's kind of where this is going with Paul. Am I still a good guy all the time? Because we like to say that all the time. It's good all the time. You get a little hangnail and you want to forget about God. <laughs> change your whole right, change your whole perspective, change your whole theology about God. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying to you, God has to answer your most recent prayer or remove your recent thorn. Are you still in love with God? I'm just asking you. I'm just wanting you to think about that. Will you still preach for God? Will you still minister for God? Will you still have a lot of hope? If God doesn't answer your prayer. Or maybe God says, no, I'm not doing that for you. Now, I know that's kind of almost like an oxymoron because God is good to us. And he does love us. And, all, and his promises are yes and amen in him. I know that. We know that. And I'm going to say it before I want to get to it. But when all is stripped away, when everything is gone, when he doesn't answer the prayers, when you don't quite always feel his love, and when you pray for somebody, yeah, even in your family, and they still pass away, he's saying to Paul, he's saying to you today, my grace is, is all you need. My love is all you ever going to need. Despite, because it's greater than your thorn. It's greater than your trouble. It's greater than your attitude. Is all you're ever going to need is my grace, which will bring you through. Not more money, not more clothes. Maybe because there's some people that when they get down, they not more food, they eat a lot, they shop a lot, buy a lot. Because see that in their way they ease the pain. But the pain never goes away. You still have the attitude. But with his grace, you're able to overcome that bad attitude. And know that you still count for God. And that God still loves you. Yeah. See, that's the kind of dialogue that is going on with, with God and Paul. And sometimes we are we go to God so many times that we can't go to God. You know, I, I, let, me, let me just say this this way. Sometimes I think we have a picture of God being Santa Claus. And then we, we, he has this big bag that we can just go pick and choose what we want. And what we want, we don't throw, we throw back. God is not Santa Claus. And that's sometimes I think how we, we as Christians think God is as a Santa Claus. No, he'll give us just what we need. When we need it. And at the right time. And his grace of heaven is everything that we'll ever, ever need. And so that's where he's going with no matter what difficulties you run into, Paul, what, no matter what oppositions you run into, Paul, no matter your, 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 your crazy attitude or your grace of nature says, my grace is sufficient for that. Amen. No matter what you have to face, and Paul was going to eventually face death, he was going to be martyred for Christ. He says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for that. Now, to take a strong woman and a strong man and stand on that, what do you mean your grace is enough? Just, that's just it. My grace is enough. And it is enough. It is enough. So, Having got to Paul's issues, but let's get to a couple of them. And we'll see some issues that Paul had. Paul's issues may have included ones 
And this is just, these are just, I'm looking at the commentaries and I've read, these are just some of the issues that uh, Paul may have had, but we know he had issues. And we know this by looking at scripture to back this up in terms of some issues that Paul was dealing with. You know, because he was dealing with his abrasive nature. He was dealing with his physical problems. He was dealing with a lack of confidence in his ability. And he was dealing with his confidence to be a, a dynamic speaker. These are things that, that he was in the realm of what he was dealing with. Now, let's turn over here real quick. And this is where I'm going to stop after we look at these scriptures. So let's go over here to Romans 7. Chapter 7. We'll go through these very quickly. <clears throat> 7. I'll be in the Amplified Bible. Romans 7. Verse 18. And this is this is this is Paul speaking, Romans seven, chapter seven, verse eighteen. So for I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my intention and urge to do. This is what we were talking about earlier: to do what is right, but no power to carry it out. For I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I am ever doing. Like he's drunk, but anyway, it's 20. Now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is no longer I doing it, it is not myself that acts, but the sin, the principle which which dwells within me, thinks it operating in my soul, something deep that he has to deal with. I find it to be a law, rule of action of my being, that when I want to do. What is right and good, evil is ever present within me, and I am subject to the its insistent demands. So we can see that Paul was dealing with the issue of his flesh. That he's doing things or having desire or desire to do things that he shouldn't do. The worst is that he didn't think about the look of gaze upon a woman as adults. Not just a mere act. Right? So he's got these things in his mind that he, it's hard that he's dealing with these things that he's dealing with that, that is the issues of the flesh. That's just one of his issues. And he's, that's one of the issues that he's inquiring God about. Whatever this is, God, take it from me. Whatever it is. And so we, we you know what, we have issues as well. And we do and say things sometimes that we know better than doing and saying, but we do them anyway. I'm the first one to tell you that. So I do things that I shouldn't do. I say things. I can't know. I say things that I shouldn't say sometimes. Whether I say it or not, she look at me and say, David, what are you thinking? Because she knows me. What's on your mind, right? What's on your mind? And you do the same thing with your children. Because you know they're thinking about something that they shouldn't be thinking about. After you've told them something. <laughs> and so we have the same propensity to do the same thing. Let's turn over here to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11. Eleven, twenty-one, and 29. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 21 to 29. And Paul, to my discredit, I must say we have shown ourselves too weak for you to show such tolerance of us and for us to do strong, courageous things that <clears throat> like that to you. But in whatever any person's bold and, and dares to boast, mind you, I am speaking in this foolish with this way, I also am bold and dare to boast. And Paul goes in now, this is the language that he was speaking. Verse 22 says, 
They are Hebrew, so am I. Now he's in his boastful mode now. He says, they are Israelites, so am I. They are descendants of Abraham, so am I. Are they ministering servants of Christ, the Messiah? He says, I am taking one beside myself. But I am more and far more expensive and abundant labors with far more imprisonments beaten with countless stripes and frequently, and we'll go on and read the rest of it later on, but this is Paul's ability to boast. To talk about himself in examples that he had a problem with at times. But it showed him his ability to speak back to his adversary. It was told here in Galatians 2, 1, 2, 11. Galatians 2, 11. Galatians 2, 11. About Paul, he may have had some physical problems. 2 11. This is, this is not a physical problem, this is when he opposed Peter. But when Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I protested and opposed him to his face concerning his conduct there, for he was wailable and stood condemned. Verse 12 Up to this time that certain persons came from James. He ate his meals with the Gentile, the converts. But when the men from Jerusalem arrived, he withdrew and held himself aloof from the Gentiles and ate separately for fear of those of the circus, of the circumcision or of the party of the Jews. So we know that Paul has the ability to, to speak boldly and speak properly to people. That's just an example of his ability to speak boldness. And he spoke boldness and with courageous, with a courageous ability to Peter, Peter who was kind of being a little biased at a particular time. And he was calling Peter out. But Peter, you're doing wrong. Now let's go to uh, Galatians 6.11. Just point out to you some issues that Paul was dealing with. Some good, some bad. But we, we know that he submitted these things to God. 6.11. Now we know that Paul, on the road to Damascus, we know that he saw Jesus. We know that there was a bright light, right? And the bright light, if, you, if you're in the presence of a bright light, the day was sunny and bright, go outside and look at the sun, and then turn around and try to look at something else. You can't see. You can't see. And so there's a theory that Paul was dealing with the after effects of that incident, where he looked at it. Yes, he had it. And there are many conditions that are associated with that kind of blindness, of looking in the bright thing. And so, Goes on and say, to say, 11, see what large letters I'm writing with my own hand? Mark carefully these, these closing words of mine. Oh, I had to write large letters, perhaps so we could see what he wrote because of his, his, his revelation uh, on the road to the masses. Just a theory, just some throwing something out to you that some of the, uh, the commentaries have said these are some of Paul's issues, but we know he had issues. We know he had physical problems. We know he was beaten unmercifully, which could have led to some of these physical problems. First Corinthians, let's go back to First Corinthians 2. That would be the last one, I believe. Uh, First Corinthians 2. No, I have one more. First Corinthians 2. I just want to show these things to you. So if someone says something, well, where, where, where are the scriptures in the, in the, in the Bible? Well, you do have them there. First Corinthians 2. If somebody always asks for proof, where's the proof? Where's the proof? First Corinthians 2 started verse 3. And I was, this is Paul speaking about himself, and I was in, passed into a state of weakness and fear, dread, and great trembling after I had come among you. And my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of his Holy Spirit and the power of God. So Paul is, is, is doubting his strength, his ability. He, he had doubts about his ability. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. As strong as Paul was, do you think he would have some confidence? No, but his confidence had to be in God. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians. I mean, there's, you know what? 
and I'll give you a perfect example. <laughs> Though I went to Tennessee and spoke, and I knew everybody there, basically there, there were still some apprehensions mm -hmm. about my ability. Mm -hmm. So I had to rely on Christ. But the point is, I, I had an apprehension. You know, you go to get to go to a new place to work. Guess what? You have apprehension. Right? You meet new people, you have apprehensions. And so Paul had apprehensions about what he was called to do. Apprehensions. You pick up a new camera. And you first use it. What are some apprehensions with it? And then the, your boss actually takes certain pictures. Well, I'm not really confident in taking that kind of picture. We have apprehensions about sometimes our abilities. Go ahead. Let's go to the last one here. I know it's taking a little bit of time, but I'm still on time here. 2 Corinthians 10 10. Right? Okay. This is what some people were saying about Paul. For they say, verse 11 of 10, his letters are weighty and impressive and forceful and telling, but his personality and bodily presence are weak, and his speech and delivery are utterly intelligible of no account. This is what people are saying about Paul. And this is what these are things, and these are things that he goes to God to inquire about, remove these kind of thorns from him. And these are unusual things. These are areas that we get caught up in and have issues and problems in as well. We know that Paul, you know, we didn't talk about the physical thought, but we know that Paul was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He had great opposition, great physical suffering. We know that Paul went through that. So Paul had a lot of issues that he, these issues he took to God. And he inquired three times, Lord, take these things away from me. Because they, they were vexing him. They were totally vexing him. Now, are these things, and I want to point these things out to you, and I'll stop there. Well, actually, 2 Corinthians 11, 21, and 29, I don't know, keep quiet. Let me read this to you. So you want to have to start talking, start talking. Because and it's on the screen. It says, it says uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, 21, 29, it says, But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness, I am just as bold as myself. Myself, are they Hebrews? We read this before, so I am. Are they Israelites? So I am. Are they descendants of Abraham? So I am. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors and far more imprisonment, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journey in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles. Dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers among false brethren. Have I been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, also without food and cold and exposure, apart from, he says, and apart from such external things, there is this daily pressure on me for the concern of the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is ready to sin without my just concern? He said, I, I've got what I lose. And so we can see the issues that finally that come, you know what, to a certain point we can handle the issue, but it gets to a certain point where the top blows off. And Paul was at the point where the top was blowing off. And they were saying, probably, is it worth the effort? Is this worth the effort? Is this worth my, 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 my death? Is this worth my, my pain? Is it worth my loss of hope? Is it is it, is it worth me still going and preaching the church and I know there's a false brethren in there? Is it worth it? Is it worth it when I pray? Is it worth it? God says to him, my grace is sufficient. And so we're going to be talking about contentment. Hopefully we'll get to that next Sunday. And also more specifically, what was this paradise we saw?
what was this unspeakable thing that he's talking about? What is this unlawful thing he's talking about? We'll get to those who try and describe those as well. Amen? Amen.